This was probably a long time coming. It should be no surprise to many that Soul Hackers 2 had quite the reception both before and after it was released. Honestly, I'm kind of worried for the future of this publisher. This was insane. There's something fascinating about the video game industry, specifically with its more underappreciated releases. They get announced, released, and we never hear from them again. However, what if things were different? What if what would have been remembered as an obscure title actually had a decent chance of being successful? A decent marketing campaign, and a reputable publisher behind it, only to fall flat on its face and give in an unclear future. Well, may I present to you today's production on... Soul Hackers 2. This was probably a long time coming. We knew this would be a big deal. We even teased it as a possibility. You can thank us later, by the way, and I don't see a better time than now to dive into this title. Now let me start by saying this. Soul Hackers 2 is a game that I was heavily intrigued by. Despite having priorities towards a little something announced relatively close to its release, I still wondered what to expect from it. Did I end up buying it and giving it a shot? Nope. I kid you not, I actually saw some reviews, thought it wasn't worth my time, and moved on. But then I was thinking, is it really as bad as people say it is? Was it a mistake to overlook this title? It should be no surprise to many that Soul Hackers 2 had quite the reception both before and after it was released. The whole DLC debate, underwhelming sales, even the developers responding to some of the criticisms. But I want to look past that and give it a second chance. Who knows, maybe this one has a chance for a new audience. This is a story filled with hope, humbleness, but sadly ends with disappointment and despair. This is our review on Soul Hackers 2. The year was 1997 and Devil Summoner Soul Hackers was released. Released on the Sega Saturn and PS1, this was another spin-off spawned from the massive franchise known as Shin Megami Tensei. While quite similar to a lot of other franchises from the series, one of the main selling points was the idea of having a party with both humans and demons combined. You had to fight enemies, solve puzzles, and negotiate with the demons to team up with them. For a Saturn title, it sold relatively well, just around 167,000 in its first week in Japan, and while we never got this version localized, it did get a 3DS remaster on April of 2013. It was pretty lackluster, to say the least. Not really a good impression for Atlas. Now you may be asking, why am I talking about Soul Hackers 1? For those who don't know, they tend to make a yearly survey for their fans to see what kind of games they want to see. And to their surprise, when asked what they like for them to make, a remake or some sort of resurgence for Soul Hackers was consistently in the top 10. With this demand for something related to the franchise, they decided to start development on a new project, a Soul Hackers sequel slash revival. This wasn't just a way to cash it either. They actually got a lot of longtime developers here, like Edgy C. Oh goodness, not names. Like Aiji Ishida and Mitsuru Hirata. People who have worked on both the Megami Tensei series and. TMS? Wow, that was quite surprising, actually. A lot of changes were made in this new entry, however. Instead of a standard 2D first-person perspective, it changed to third-person with a 3D perspective. There was a new cast, new world, new conflict, new UI? Wow. This game was truly looking to have a bright future for both Soul Hackers and Atlas as a company. You see, Atlas around this time has kind of been a bit complicated place, to say the least. Most of their releases have been either ports or not what people have been wanting. And so with Soul Hackers being revived, not only did this mean it could make the franchise stronger with its new audience, but this could potentially mean more Megami Tensei revivals. We're talking Devil Survivor, Digital Devil Saga, maybe even all these ones here. Even developers were really excited to finally show this game off. This is what IG himself said about the game once the official trailer was announced. There were always many requests for a sequel, so this title was always in the back of my mind even when I was working on other projects. I'm relieved that we're going to be able to release a new game, but that at the same time, I'm scared to death that we won't be able to meet everyone's expectations. This is a perfect example of a game that was just heavily overlooked for so long, finally having a proper chance with more eyes on it. As for what else was made in the game, I have a small list here. As a contrast to Soul Hackers 1, they wanted to go against the dystopian themes and make a team with a non-human character playing as the lead protagonist. That character would soon be evolved to Ringo. What's interesting is she wasn't initially going to be the protagonist. She was meant to be, as Hirata put it, an electronic fairy who accompanied the other main characters. Though the idea was scrapped due to not being unique enough, so they changed her to be the main lead and changed characters to fit her in. There's surprisingly a few interviews between these two talking about what changes they made. It's really easy to see that this was a game that had a lot of passion and love poured into it. Soul Hackers 2 was officially announced in February of 2022 for PS 
PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Series X, and PC even. They didn't keep the Devil Summoner moniker anymore for easier branding. Eventually, we got the game on August 25th, 26th, to a surprisingly worldwide release. Wow, Atlas really must have had faith in this one. So why don't we get into the core of this production? The story is actually pretty simple. The protagonist, Ringo, and her friend Figu are two... um... I think they're a code? They're both basically data from Ion, a digital hive mind within humanity. These two are incarnated as human beings with the mission of stopping the world from a world-ending apocalypse and preventing the death of two people, Aero and Ichiro Onda. As the two split up to find them, Ringo stumbles across Aero but finds he is already dead by the time she is there. With no other option, she decides to make a soul hack. In other words, bringing a person back to life. I will say that this was a very bizarre plot point at first, but it does have its own consequences if gone wrong. Anyway, Ringo brings Arrow back from the dead, we get a bit more context to what's going on, save another friend named Milady, get more context on the story, and save yet another person named Saizo. After helping these guys out, we start to see the bigger picture here. This so-called end of the world is later revealed to be a goal of our antagonist named Iron Mask, who wants to get all five of these things called covenants. Covenants are, to put it simply, a form of power that can pass over a human soul. These hold very strong abilities, and if a holder gets all five, they get to create a new world but end up destroying their current one. Keep in mind, however, that if one holds a covenant but dies, it'll go to the most fitting person who can hold it, or closest to it from what I've seen. So it's up to Ringo, Figu, Arrow, Milady, and Saizo to stop Iron Mask from getting control to end their current world. There's, of course, way more to the story, and heck, a few turns and twists I wasn't expecting, but this is the narrative at its core, you could say. So what did I think of it? Um, there's both many things I really, really like, but also things that I saw that were really dumb. So let me just start off by saying that the story as a whole is quite fascinating. It gives this very idea that everything's done for, that feeling of just giving up. Even the characters feel this way in certain moments, and you can really feel for them. The whole plot and story does a lot of things I've been wishing for myself, too. Let's start with Ringo as a protagonist. I absolutely love this character. She's just a really nice and sweet person. We get to see her learn more about how humans behave, despite being one herself. Whenever you see her feel an emotion or have a good time with the group, it's basically her first time, so it just makes those moments much more special. She tends to have a similar attitude and hopefulness of a kid, but still has the age and maturity of an adult. I also adore the contrast between her and Figu. While Ringo is very outgoing and just wants to have fun, Figu is seen as more of a motherly figure in a way. She's very gentle, caring, a bit slower to understand humans, but when she does eventually see what they're really like, it's really heartwarming. We have Arrow and Milady who both worked for Yadagarasu, and Phantom society, respectively. Two massive organizations of devil summoners, but each of them took their path for their reasons. For example, Arrow chose to be in Yadagaratsu since they approached him first. However, this meant he'd have to part ways with one of his longtime friends, who, no joke, teamed up with Phantom Society, and we actually see the two fight it out for their stance of this soon-to-be apocalypse. You can already guess by now that my main positives are the characters, which, how couldn't it be? Atlas really took genuine and realistic issues people their age could face, and fit them into a narrative with the concept of a world soon about to end. I genuinely felt I could relate to these people. They all went through horrible and tragic lives, really affecting them in the long term and making them the people you're talking to now. But there's also way more outside of that. You get to see what they like, who they loved, and it just further defines their motivation while still keeping it the same goal. I'd go as far as to say they're the main reason to even check this game out, but how does the plot itself compare? Decent enough, I suppose. The whole conflict itself is really straightforward. It really just boils down to gathering a few clues that eventually lead to stopping our main villain. Uh, however, this is where it kind of makes a little bit of a twist. You know when you kill Iron Mask, or Raven I should say? I kid you not, Figu's emotions overtook her to the point that in a desperate attempt wanted to bring him back via a soul hack. This was shocking, but not only that, Raven didn't choose to go with her. He accepted his fate and knew this was the path he had to go. This is really some symbolic and beautiful to see. You never really see what a villain or antagonist feels after their defeat. Do you try to get revenge? Do you accept it? So it was quite nice to see this. What really surprised me is that after the Covenants left Raven and went to Figu, she decided to pursue the goals of Raven and create this new world but with the intention of stopping people from fighting. This was insane. But when you take into consideration what she's seen from his soul hack and the idea of protecting the new generations, she felt like this was right. And as Ringo learns, while they're both the same kind of thing from Ion, they're still human and so they have their own beliefs and morals. The best way to describe it would be 
refreshing. Maybe I just have pretty low standards for storytelling, but it was truly an experience I never would have expected. I do wish the game could look into more about this world, especially with the whole demons interacting with the Devil Summoner's part. What does it exactly take to be a Devil Summoner? There's a lot of things I'd love to learn about this world, but it's not that big of a deal. Oh jeez, this has been going on for quite a while. I guess I should go over the mechanics. Soul Hackers 2 is very similar to your typical Atlas JRPG. Gameplay mainly boils down to two different sections, either dungeon crawling and fighting demons, or being part of the story and or a side story with characters. Though there's a lot here that is someone coming from titles like Persona and TMS, it kind of took me by surprise. First off, you're not able to change who's in your party. The story will often say that you can't use said character for narrative purposes like Figu having the Covenant, making it dangerous for her to be in combat. So throughout the entirety of the game, you'll play as Ringo, Arrow, Melady, and Sizer. At first, this was somewhat disappointing since I really liked a lot of the other characters like Ash and Figu. You're also not exactly able to upgrade your weapons. Or, I should say, you can't just buy a new sword that has more attack power. The way it works is that in here you upgrade your weapons, or comps as the game puts it, by modifying certain attributes of them. You can buy upgrades to hold specific accessories, give it more attack power, etc. When in combat, one of the main ways you'd be doing damage in the game is by stacks and sabbaths. Let's say you're fighting a demon and it's weak to ice. You pull out the one that casts Bufu type spells and attack it, but on top of that it'll activate this little counter up here. What this does is once your party's turn is over, Ringo will summon in the demons responsible for that spell and charge at the enemy for extra damage. Many criticize the system for being too simple, but this was so much fun to use. There's definitely a decent learning curve if you want to make a stack of around 6 or more, and can feel very satisfying to perform. You'll definitely want to rely on exploiting weaknesses and stacking as much for your Sabbaths, because because skills on their own can be pretty underwhelming to say the least. Heck, you can give your demons the ability to do more afterwards, like make them sleep or an extra attack on top of the Sabbath. You'll also definitely want to focus on fusing your demons too. The way you'd get them is by talking to them and forming a negotiation. It's common to just see one standing as you explore the dungeon, and if you speak to them, they'll most likely want something in return. Outside of dungeon exploring or following the story, you also have the option to explore the soul matrix. This is where you'll be exploring around to get more insight on the party members' pasts. In order to progress through the soul matrix though, you need to collect enough soul points. These are just a counter that shows the strength of your bond with others. You can gain them through siding with their perspective or hanging out at the bar with them. Wonder how Ringo hasn't gotten drunk from drinking that much. As a whole, it really isn't too far off from just a smaller scale SMT title. There are some things I do have an issue with though. I need to question this camera angle. Like, why does it have to expose Ringo's behind as you explore? It's not even for that, it's just a really bad angle since you can't see what's in front of you too well. Thankfully, they fixed this with a patch a few months after its release. I must say a lot of things were actually adjusted from this update, many of them being actual criticisms from fans, like how you couldn't speed up the battles without without letting your characters attack themselves, for example. Graphically, the game looks stunning. Some say it looks a bit generic, but I don't mind. If you've seen our Persona 6 production I mentioned, I love how Atlas designs their UIs with their titles, and Soul Hackers 2 doesn't disappoint. It has that technological feel while mixing it up by using purple as its main color, and the character portraits look amazing. I do need to admit that the bloom in this game is absolutely insane. I get it, it's meant to look modern and futuristic, but this is overkill. As for music, it's really really good too. Yeah, it gets very repetitive, but that's mainly since there isn't much of a variety as a whole. You'll be hearing the same song when going through dungeons, which can get a bit tiring. Oh, and that doesn't even mention the fact that these are literal mazes. I'm not kidding. Just look at these and tell me you're fine with navigating around these areas. You basically had to use these teleportation spots and guess which path you had to go. If you were wrong and couldn't teleport your way out, you had to go all the way back and guess again. It just sort of felt like a way to pad out your playtime. And I guess I should mention what I've been avoiding the whole time. The DLC. I've been ignoring this part since it is where a lot of my negatives will come from. Alright, so for a bit of context, when this game was announced, it was confirmed that there was going to be day one DLC available. Ranging from small boosts for experience and money to costumes for the playable characters. These are basically expected from any new Atlas release, and I'll be honest, the costumes here do look really nice. Where things get very controversial, however, is in this. The bonus story arc, The Lost Numbers. You would have to be living under a rock to think that people would like the idea of a story content of a game to be locked behind a paywall, especially if it's released alongside the first day. And to nobody's surprise, this left a lot of people speaking against it. 
Atlas as of late has been pretty scummy with their DLC. Stripping out content from their games like powerful demons and boosts is a cheap pay-to-win faster strategy. While I'm not super against this way of marketing the DLC, I do feel in the case of Soul Hackers 2, this is too far. It's not just the fact that they locked a story arc behind it. If you want the full Soul Hackers 2 experience, you'd be spending upwards of $90 if you get the digital premium edition. This is just ridiculous, and this was kind of one of the reasons why I didn't buy this game at first. Why allow Atlas to further do this and probably make this issue even worse? But I suppose with all the steam of this title gone, what did I overall think of the story arc? It's fine, I guess. So it isn't so much of an actual story as it is DLC, it's more of just a side story added in their Atlas releases but sold as DLC. Or, to put it in better terms, imagine Persona 5's Royale's editions like Kasumi and Maruki and sell them as a DLC pack for the base game. That's all you're really getting. For the story, you meet this new girl named Nana, who's a freelance devil summoner from outside the city. She sort of follows you throughout these side quests to help her find more about herself and her purpose. Eh, I don't know. I just felt like this was pretty half-baked as a whole. All you really get is a new dungeon, some more bosses to do, which seemed to be a literal pain to deal with. And Nana as a character is fine, but I just didn't feel like she did much for me. This isn't even mentioning that this DLC pack alone is one-sixth of its release price. The main story was already fine as it is anyway. I guess if you just want more from this title, you can check it out, but I'd really suggest just sticking with the base game. Hopefully this is the last time Atlas would attempt something like this. With all that said, how did this game come about? While it did rank number 15 on best-selling games in its release month, it still sold below Sega's expectations, debuting with about 52,000 units in Japan. Though now developers are believing that it'll sell more in the long term thanks to its new update, fixing a lot of the issues the game had at the start. Fair to say that with the reception of it, the future of this one isn't too bright. The general consensus among fans when playing this title was also very mixed, to say the least. A lot of people, including myself, see it as perfectly fine, yet some claim it's just disappointing, and I guess it just snowballed into this effect that the game isn't really worth your time. I kind of understand them. When compared to other Atlas titles, I think the main reason Soul Hackers 2 was so underwhelming to a lot of people is just a lack of true identity. Atlas has been heavily hyping this game up, saying that this is going to be a third pillar to stand alongside Megami Tensei and Persona. And in a way, I feel like this sort of affected the game's performance through expectations. I could see what Atlas wanted to do with this franchise, but at the same time, it feels like they couldn't, or wanted to commit entirely to the idea. There's a noticeable lack of things that could help it stand out from its contemporaries. All of the dungeons here are just mazes with very simple themes and have very little substance. Outside of the stacks and sabbaths, there really isn't much making this game shine. Just compare all that with the kind of stuff we've been seeing in both the Persona and Shimagami Tensei series. These two have been actively pushing themselves forward, making creative designs for the worlds, and always innovating on their already existing mechanics. Soul Hacker's in this really weird position, trying to stand out but doesn't know all the ways it needs to. It feels different, wants to be, but there wasn't enough of the budget to fully realize those ideas. What will this mean for Soul Hackers and Atlas? Honestly, I'm kind of worried for the future of this publisher. As of now, their latest releases were Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden, two games over a decade old by now. And so if this game is a disappointment to the company, it's sad to say this, but I don't think we'll see another revival like this for a while. That's not to say that Soul Hackers 2 is killing any potential for another series, but things seem not in the best right now. Will there be a Soul Hackers 3? It's likely there will be, and hopefully a way to learn from the mistakes this one made. Though I don't see it happening anytime soon. Maybe once Persona 6 does eventually get its release. <sighs> this was a very interesting production to make. I've been reviewing a lot of JRPGs, looking over so many unique and incredible concepts, only for them to be overshadowed by more mainstream titles in the market. And somehow, Soul Hackers 2 has the opposite happening in a way. There was so much potential, so much going for it, and there was actually a lot of good in this game. Sadly, with the lack of certain things to stand out besides the story, this game was overshadowed not by its competition, but instead the small problems people had and the poor decisions made on Atlas's part. Look, should you play Soul Hackers 2? Personally, I'd much rather give this a chance than dismiss it as bad. That said, do get it on a sale. <laughs> it might not be a masterpiece, nor the next big Atlas title. Heck, probably not even a good Soul Hackers game. But under all that blandness and issues that this thing went through though, I still want to respect it for what it does right. Not only that, I really want to see stuff like an adult cast, a unique protagonist, and creative setting in any future releases. I really do hope that this game, and especially Atlas, can make an eventual comeback soon. This is Akari Oe from Mentjoy Pictures.